name is Pastor John Longwell with XCD. Today I'd like to share a message with you on not being anxious according to what the Word of God has to say about it. Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, I just pray that as uh, we get into your Word today and we learn what you have to say about being anxious, that uh, your Holy Spirit would minister with power the ability for us to take to heart the things that we receive from your word, that we might be able to apply them to our lives and see real effective change. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I always like to start off a sermon with a bad joke. And the joke I'd like to share today is uh, God, he just finishes up a, a really good day. And so he wants to share about it with one of his angels. He goes up to one of his angels and he says, um, crap. <laughs> I can't remember what I was going to say. Don't you hate it when you forget what you're going to say, kind of put you on the spot, get you a little bit anxious every once in a while? Well, we don't have to worry about being anxious when it comes to what we're going to say. In fact, Luke 12 verses 11 through 12 says, and when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So is there anything more reassuring than when the Bible tells us not to be anxious? We're gonna camp out a little bit today in Matthew chapter six, verses 25 to 34. It may be a very familiar section of the word to many of us. He says in verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And in the Synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have a lot of similar verses and actions recorded. And Luke actually goes on to say in Luke 12, 26, he adds, If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? And essentially what he's saying is, is there anything that we could be more anxious about than how long we're going to live? If we had by the ability of us worrying about how long our life is to be, being anxious, able to add a single minute more, then wouldn't we also then go ahead and apply that same formula to everything else? But he's saying, since by worrying about your lifespan, you're not able to add even a single second more to it, why are you worried about this or anything else? And we pick back up in chapter 28 of, Luke, of, of Matthew 6. And he says, And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little, little faith? So I'm, I'm 48 years old, and so I've had 40 plus springs to look forward to every year. And regardless of how many times I experience spring, I always look forward to the new foliage, the new blossoms, just being able to see the flowers in full bloom. It only lasts for a couple of months, but I'm always anticipating that season of the year. It's so beautiful. And so what we're hearing from the Word of God is that here we have flowers which don't spend any effort on the colors that they're adorned with or anything that, that makes up how they're arrayed. And yet they're one of the most beautiful things. And we compare that to the greatest, most lavish king that lived, which was King Solomon. King Solomon had an untold amount of riches, 
by which he could um, adorn his, his own person as well as his kingdom. And it makes the comparison here that even Solomon in all of his glory was not, is not even to be compared to the beauty of these flowers which are here one moment and in the next moment they're gone. He says, but if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? He says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things and the Gentiles just meaning those that don't um, subscribe to or follow after the things of God. He says, they are anxious about these things, and yet your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He says, but instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for today is its own trouble. You see, Jesus makes a pretty good case for not being anxious. But what does it mean to be anxious? Being anxious simply means experiencing worry, being at unease or nervous. And it's typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. You know, life in general. And I like to add in basically everything that we don't have any kind of control over. So basically we're given a command, do not be anxious. And God never gives us a command without also giving us the ability to walk that command out in, into obedience. All right, so let's summarize the Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. He's basically covered the basic necessities, um, that which we eat or drink and that which we wear. So the very, the very essentials of life. But he also goes on in verse 34 and says, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. He kind of says, you know what? Okay, we've covered the basic necessities. Now, anything that you could be concerned with as it relates to something like maybe your job or relationship or some sort of an, an event that you're going to encounter in the next 24 hours, don't worry about that. Because number one, by worrying about tomorrow, which isn't even here, we don't even, we, tomorrow is never tangible, it's always 24 hours away, we don't have the ability to affect change, to make any difference. And so he says, push that away, today has enough troubles of its own. And he's also saying that if you will focus on what you can do today, then guess what, you're going to actually make change so that you don't have to worry or be anxious about tomorrow. So we've defined what it means to be anxious and we've, we've been given a commandment which is basically not to be anxious. But what if the reality that we're dealing with is we are anxious right now? Maybe even as I've been sharing this sermon, your mind has been going off on a couple of tangents because you're, you're, you're clouded, your you're thinking is is confused because you've got a lot of things on your mind and they're things that are causing you concern and worry. Maybe the state that you're in right now is you are anxious. What do we do if we're in that place? And I want to cover that right now. What we need to do is we need to exercise our God-given authority. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 3 through 6 it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your, dis when your obedience is complete. So basically what we need to understand is that the world in which we live in is more than just our flesh and blood. We deal with a world that also has a spiritual unseen realm. And within that realm, there are influences that actually weigh and can impact the physical realm in which we live. 
we're told that the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh, but divine power to destroy strongholds. Well, what's a stronghold? If we were at battle with another nation and that nation came in and they developed a stronghold, it would be an area where we were weak. It, it might be a place that we couldn't properly defend because of the location. Maybe it's a place that we couldn't properly um, reinforce with supplies. And so that becomes an area of weakness for us. And the enemy might have a better position to be able to defend that. And they come in and they take power over that area. Now, when it comes to us personally, areas that the enemy develops a stronghold are just like that. They're areas that are weaknesses for us. Maybe there are areas in which we have temptation and the enemy knows that he knows how we operate. And so he'll constantly tempt us in those areas. He'll use the influences of even other people or maybe things that are on television to go in there and to establish his force of power. Well, God has said that we don't need to simply surrender when it comes to these strongholds, the areas of weaknesses in, in, within our own lives we can go in there and we can take authority over those areas where we are weak. Now I want to share an example of where I've had a stronghold in my own thinking. Uh, I've had some areas of regret in, in my life and it has to do with some jobs that some job decisions that I've made over the last 15 years. And even though I've resolved in it and I'm moving forward and I don't typically deal with it on a regular basis, every once in a while, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and my mind will just be swarming with these thoughts of regret and real feelings of, of remorse over the decisions that I made. Even though I don't have any power right now, I can't go back in time, I can't change any of the decisions that I made. So what do I do to overcome this area of weakness that the enemy tries to reinforce as a stronghold in my life? What I do is I'll pray a prayer like this. I'll say, Lord Jesus, I'm really struggling right now with these thoughts and they, they just seem to, to keep coming and attacking me. Lord God, I ask that you would take authority over these thoughts. Take them captive. Allow the sweet, uh, precious sleep that you have promised me to be restored to me. Give me your peace, give me your joy, and allow me not to be plagued by these thoughts anymore. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. It's as simple as praying a prayer to establish the authority that we have been given in God. That's a way in which we wage warfare in that unseen spiritual realm. Verse 32, it says, For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He says, But instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So we actually have almost a recipe here for how to not be anxious. He says, number one, understand that your father knows that you need all of these things. If we can understand that God knows our situation, then it can give us that much more peace. One of the worst things that we can encounter is having a problem and being isolated and alone in the midst of that. It's so much better when we're able to share the struggles that we have with someone else. And it's even better to share those struggles with someone that has power to help us. And that's the very one that we share all of our struggles and our needs with, God. He knows exactly what we need. And he says that if we will seek him first, then all of these things will be added to us. Well, what does it mean to seek God first? Luke 1231, which is another one of the, the synoptic gospels, it says, instead, seek his kingdom and these things will be added to you. So what does it mean and how do I seek God's kingdom and his righteousness? We're going to outline about four ways in which we can seek God's kingdom. The first one is simply through his word. We just read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, what it means to take authority over those things that would try to develop a stronghold in our lives. So by reading God's word, studying it, meditating upon it, and memorizing it, and recalling it, we can then stand upon it, and we can pray it. 
to see real effective change in our lives. There's a really neat scripture in, in the Beatitudes. It's in Matthew chapter five, verse three, and the Beatitudes are basically all of the blessed are you scriptures. And verse three says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So this is a really cool equation here. If you are poor in spirit, guess what? You don't even have to seek after the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is already yours. Well, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? To be poor in spirit means that we have a constant awareness of our need for God. We, we basically embrace our utter dependence upon Him. We acknowledge the fact that without God, we are not able to do anything. And what it does is it helps us to come to a place of humility before God. And in 1 Peter 5, 6-7 it says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. So once again, when we seek first God, what we're doing is we're getting ourselves in a place to where we can receive from God. And it's important to realize that because sometimes we're, we don't want to receive in the way that maybe God has a provision for us. We read in, in Matthew 6 the, in, in where it says not to be anxious about what we're going to eat or what we're going to drink or what we're going to, to wear. And we would probably know that there's a lot of um, nonprofit organizations. I know that my own church, we have provided um, real practical needs for members of our church when they've had a need. It's, it's one of the benefits of being a part of a church body. My wife works for the Human Services Department, Income Support, and when people uh, qualify for a certain level of um, lower income, they also receive cash assistance, which can be used to purchase clothes and things of, of the, the, the real essentials. Um, they, can, they can get on SNAP, which is the food stamp, so that they can buy the basic necessities at a grocery store. And one of the things that is sometimes difficult, and it can be a real attack on our pride, is when we find ourselves in a, destit in a destitute or a needy situation. We don't always want to take advantage of the resources that are available to us. We don't want to take advantage of secondhand clothing or maybe generic um, no-name brand um, food that, that you can get at like a food pantry. And yet, God is saying, if you will seek me first, guess what? You're gonna find that your, your heart is gonna be in the right place to where pride is no longer an issue, that you're going to be able to receive of the resources that are available to you. Now, we just talked about how in um, seeking God's kingdom first, we do that through his word. And by being in his word and being poor of spirit, we're at that place of humility and one of the actions that we should do is pray. And you're gonna find that almost in any good sermon, they're always gonna direct you to two places. They're gonna direct you back to the Word of God, and they're going to direct you back to prayer. We don't pray so that God can learn about what it is that is on our mind or on our hearts. We pray so that we can learn about God's perspective on our situation. And we learn to pray with authority as we learned about earlier. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7, he says, once again, the command, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And this is really interesting how he says, Don't be anxious, but in everything prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Sometimes when we're in need and we don't approach it from that poor of spirit with that utter dependence upon God, we don't look upon our situation as something to be thankful for. And God is saying, regardless of what your circumstances are, I am worthy of all of your gratitude and all of your thanks. And we'll know that we're in that poor of spirit place when we can pray a prayer that says, thank you, Jesus, for providing for my needs. I'm not where I want to be, but I know that you have the ability to provide the resources for me and to meet my needs. 
even in the midst of this difficult situation. And this is another example of the great exchange. There's, there's, a, there's many great exchanges in the Word of God. The first one, of course, is when we exchanged our sinful nature for the free gift of righteousness that was purchased by Christ that is then applied unto our lives. The second exchange is this. We give over to God all of our anxieties and in return, as it says in verse 7 of Philippians 4, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What an amazing exchange. He says, if you'll give me this, this, the horrible worries and concerns that you're dealing with, I'm going to give you a peace that you don't even have to comprehend, nor will you be able to comprehend how it functions. And what it's going to do is it's going to guard your heart and it's going to guard your mind so that when the enemy comes to attack you in those areas that we learned about, where we really do battle in that spirit realm, he's not gonna be able to penetrate your thinking and he's not gonna be able to penetrate your heart so that you worry because the peace of God is now guarding you. That is an amazing exchange. The next way in which we um, seek first God's kingdom is we take inventory of the treasure that is stored in our heart. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It doesn't say where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. It literally says where your treasure is, is basically a mirror of where your heart is. And what he's referring to is the stuff of life. Earlier in that scripture, in verse 19 and 20, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But instead, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, which is basically seeking first the kingdom of God, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Let's face it, you get something new, you want to keep it new. You want to make sure that you protect it. Um, when, when I got my new iPhone, I immediately signed up for Apple Care, just for the circumstance that maybe if I drop the phone, if it gets broken, I'll have something that will be able to allow me to bring, bring or restore my, my, my purchase back to its original state. When we go on vacation, we lock up our house, our houses. When we go to work, we lock up our cars. We don't want our possessions to be stolen or to be destroyed or to be ruined. You see, the reality is the more stuff we have, the more our stuff has us. Stuff becomes a point of concern, a point of worry, and at certain times it can be even come a point of idolatry. We can almost become so consumed with our stuff that we begin to put all of our focus on it. But by keeping God first, by keeping a, a good balance between enjoying the things that God allows us to have, being good stewards of them, we will then keep God first in our hearts. And when we do this, everything else will fall into a perfect order and we won't be anxious about the things of this world. Now, the next thing that's a little bit related to this is we sometimes need to examine our expectations. We can sometimes become too destination oriented. And let me give you an example from the Bible of this. In the Old Testament, we're familiar with the prophet Moses. Moses went before the Pharaoh of Egypt and he basically, through God's um, use of a bunch of plagues, was able to have his people freed from their slavery from the Pharaoh. And once they were freed, they had an 11 day journey to the promised land, which God was giving to them. It was a land that they were going to occupy where it was, it was said that it was flowing with milk and honey. So it was a fertile land. But because of the disobedience and because the Jews were grumbling, even as they were leaving Egypt, their 11 day journey turned into a 40 year journey. And we hear about that and we're like, man, if they'd only been obedient, they would have been able to get to their destination so much quicker. But one of the things that we need to look at 
is even though maybe the timeline was extended from 11 days to 40 years, God's presence was still with the children of God, with those Israelites. His fire was in their presence at night and there was a cloud that represented his presence during the day. He provided for their physical needs um, by providing manna. He provided water at times for them as they were going through the wilderness and, and they encountered a place where there was no water. They were given guidance. God set up judges and leaders that would be able to help them with their basically their, their societal things, the things that came up in civil discourse if they had a problem with their neighbor. And so God was very much a part of their, of their journey, even though their destination was pushed back. And I think it's important that we realize that God is not so concerned about our destination as he is being present in the journey. And I think we need to remember that because mainly when we look at the destination, the destination is something that's a, that is set off into the future. And we're already told in chapter 34 of Matthew 6, therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so once again, God is basically saying, if there were any question about what I don't you wanna be anxious about, I'm gonna cover it by that, by that saying, do not be anxious about tomorrow. Let us not be so destination oriented that we miss God's presence. When the destination is God's presence, our ultimate expectation will never be disappointed and we will have no reason to be anxious. And finally, the last thing that I'd like to share with you, we should seek to be available by God. The sermon I've entitled, Don't Be Anxious, Be Available. I recently took a trip to Boston. I stayed at the Doubletree in Chelsea, which is pretty close to the airport. And I, I specifically chose that hotel because they had free shuttle service to and from the airport. There wasn't a subway station very near where I, where I was staying, but there is a subway station at the airport. So when I was ready to go on um, my sightseeing tours for the day, I would simply get on the shuttle. They would drop me off at the airport right by the subway station. And then when I was done seeing the sights for the day, I would go take the subway back to the airport and then I would call for the shuttle and they would come pick me up. Well, there were some other people staying at the Doubletree. In fact, I ran into two of them on one of my journeys back from the airport to the hotel. They were elderly ladies and I just heard them say, I, I don't know where we find the, the shuttle to the Doubletree. And so I went up to them and I said, hey, are you guys um, going to the Doubletree in Chelsea? And they said, yes, we are. And I said, well, I've just called for the van and he'll be here shortly. So just come on over to where I'm standing over by this curb. And so the, the shuttle driver got there and as we were all on our drive back from the airport to the, to the hotel, one of the ladies looked over at me and she said, are you sure you're not an angel? Now, when I had gone on my trip, the, the first day before I was getting ready to leave the hotel, I only had a couple of sites. I was gonna go see MIT and Harvard, and then the next day I was gonna go on a Harvard tour and then go to a comedy show. So I didn't have any real fast and firm plans that I had to, that, or, or deadlines that I had to meet. And so I, I prayed a prayer on the first morning before I set out and I said, Lord God, please just use me in a way to, to bless other people. I just wanna be available for you to use in whatever way that you would see fit. And as it turned out, I, I happened to be used as, a, as kind of a quasi tour guide. For the next day, I was on the van and I was actually headed to the airport to be dropped off at the subway station. And there was a guy and he was from the South and he'd never even been on a subway before. And so when I got to the, um, we, we were in a conversation on the way and I said, well, what are you gonna be doing? He said, well, I'm gonna go on a bus tour of the city. He says, but I have no idea where to go. He said, I've never even been on a subway before. So when we got to the subway station, I, I showed him where to go to buy his subway ticket. I showed him which platform to go to. It was a really cool opportunity for me to just provide a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of comfort, you know, to maybe alleviate some of the anxieties that you can have when you're when you're in a foreigner in a foreign city and you don't know quite how to get around. In fact, it was really neat. Um, when I got off the subway to my destination, he had actually been on the same train with me and he, he ran up the escalators and, and he said, 
that, uh, hey, I was on the same train as you, I, I got my ticket, and he was, he was really stoked because I was able to help him out with, um, with his actual need. And so by being available, we do something. We take the focus off of our own worries and our concerns, and we then become used by God. And that's one of the best ways to stop what can sometimes be such a self-centered focus, which in a lot of ways, that's where anxiety is rooted and that's where it stays rooted when our focus is only on ourselves. When we get outside of ourselves, we're able to be used by God and simply being available is such an amazing thing. And so before I close today, I want to give it another crack at the joke that I was that I was trying to share with you earlier. I think my anxiety has, has finally subsided. And so let's go ahead and let's let's try this joke again. So God was up there. He had just completed doing something amazing and he wanted to share it with one of the angels. And so he told one of the angels, he says, do you know what I have just done? I've just created a 24 hour period of alternating light and darkness on earth. Isn't that amazing? And the angel looked at him and said, man, that, that's really cool. He said, well, what are you going to do now? He said, I think I'm going to call it a day. With that, let's go ahead and pray. Lord God, we thank you that you care for us. We thank you that there is nothing that concerns us, whether what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, uh, even our tomorrows, you are concerned about that. And you've told us, you've given us the command not to be anxious, but you've also given us the resources and the ability so that we don't have to be anxious. You've given us the authority in the spiritual realm to uh, take authority over those strongholds that try to set themselves up in the areas of our weakness. And Father God, you've given us your word. You've given us the ability to pray and to simply ask you uh, to lift up to the, the things that we're worried and concerned about. Lord, help us to, to maintain a good balance when it comes to the stuff in our life so that the real treasure in our heart would be you. And also we ask that we would examine our expectations so that at the end of the day, the real destination that we have would be your presence in our life. Lord Jesus, help us to apply the things that we've heard from your word today so that they might have a real effect and an impact in the lives that we live. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for watching XCD. This is one of our ministry messages. Um, please subscribe to the channel. If you like what you see, give us a thumbs up. God bless you. Thank you.